I'm about 100 pages into a history book, a book about the First World War. And the book is kind of in that style a lot of people think of when they think of history lectures, of history lessons, of history books. It's basically a report, one thing after another. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this person did this, then this person said that, etc. And now 100 pages into it, I'm asking myself, so what? What does all of this mean? I, I see the facts, although there's no possible way I'm going to remember the overwhelming majority of these facts. I have an impression, but I, I okay, I understand all of these facts. But what do they mean? So what? What is the significance of this stuff that I'm reading? And this is an important question. Not just what do I see, but what is the meaning of what I see? This is a question that's at the heart of St. Augustine's book on Christian teaching. In this book, he points out that in the world all around us are signs, are things, right, are objects. And we can look at these objects and state what these objects are and we can describe them. And that's a kind of reading, a reading of the world. We can read signs in books, right? A word would be a sign. What a sentence describes, that's kind of a sign, right? But, and that is a kind of reading, and we can look at the world and see the world and describe the world, and that's a kind of reading of the world. But Augustine wants to encourage us to do a deeper kind of reading, to see not only the sign, but the significance of the sign. Here's a quote from Augustine's book. He says that a sign is a thing which of itself makes some other thing come to mind. So you see a sign, you see an image, and you can identify that image, but then that image makes some other thing come to mind. Or, let's put it this way, you see the sign, you recognize the sign, you know what the sign is. But then you want to ask, but what does the sign signify? What does it mean? What, what underlying message does it have? And I think about this when I think about history. Now there is a, an academic discipline called semiotics, right? And this is the study of signs, symbols, and their meanings. And of course, St. Augustine was a leader in the Christian church. He's a bishop in the Christian church in the late 300s, early 400s. And so he is a Christian leader writing for a Christian audience. But this book is seen as having a broader appeal because of these important points uh, that Augustine makes about being a good reader, about being a good teacher, about seeing signs, and then looking for the significance of the signs. And so this is an important book. Now one of the things we might do when we look at history, or actually when we look at prehistory, that is before there is writing, is we can look at what prehistoric people did, and some things we can know about what they did through scientific study, the study of DNA, other sorts of you know hard sciences. But there's, there's a kind of information I think we can gain about prehistoric people simply by, uh, by looking at those people as what they were, human beings. If I was in that prehistoric person's position, why might I have done such and such? Okay? And of course, we want to bring as many academic disciplines to bear as we can on any topic so that we can have the greatest possible understanding. But I do think that when it comes to history, history is about people, about the decisions people make, about things people do, about motivations that people have. I do think that a lot of the best historical analysis is really just reflecting on people as people. If I were in that position, why might I have done what those people did? Let's kick it off by looking at the case of Atsi here. Now it should be pronounced Utsi, I think, but that I'm just going to go ahead and be a, a 21st century American and pronounce it Atsi. And so Atsi died uh, more than 5,000 years ago, and he died right on the Austria-Italy border, the present-day Austria-Italy border, just inside Italy, and his body was found by hikers in 1991, and Atsi is very important because his body is the oldest intact human body that we have. And there's a lot of information you can look up. Here we have photos of Atsi there encased in ice, and then we have 
photo, uh, there a photo of uh, Atsi's body being taken out of the ice. Now, one of the things that we learn about Atsi as a result of scientific endeavor is what was in his stomach. So there's no possible way just by, you know, reflecting on Atsi human to human, there's no possible way we could know uh, what he had in his stomach uh, when he died. But he had um, uh, meat from two different kinds of animals. He had grains in his stomach. He had berries in his stomach. So he had a, a, a varied diet. We know that he had an arrow about three inches into um, one of his shoulders. We know that he also experienced a violent blow in the back of his head. And we know that he had other people's blood, traces of other people's blood on his knife. Now, none of these things can we know, again, just by reflection. And so historians depend on people from other disciplines to bring very important information to the table so that we can have a, a fuller understanding uh, of, of what happened in the past. So there is some kind of historical knowledge that cannot be had simply by reflecting on historical humans, you know, sort of having a dialogue with them. You know, I'm a human, you were a human when you were alive 5,000 years ago, um, and so if I were in your place, why might I have done what you did? That kind of understanding I think is very useful, but of course it's limited, and you can't know what was in Nazi's stomach, for example, doing that. And so we recognize the limitations of this. Now, we have a sign here in the form of Atsi's shoes. And you see down below a recreation of Atsi's shoes. And the scientists were able to tell us what these shoes were made of. Bear skin, uh, soles, deer hide tops, tree bark netting, grass insulation. All right. Now, so let's look at this. The, the, the shoe is a sign. Well, what is that? That's a shoe. Okay, so that's easy. It's a shoe. But what does this shoe, this particular shoe, signify, right? Notice that we have four elements at work here. Bare skin soles, deer hide tops, tree bark netting, and grass insulation. What does that signify? I think it signifies a certain mastery over nature in some respect. Um, an, an understanding of the natural world. Why bearskin soles and deer hide tops? I don't know the answer to that. I think we'd probably have to turn to scientists to tell us that. But certainly we can see some significance here under the sign that we can imagine a human being creating these shoes um, with, you know, sort of physical reality in mind. Remember that um, Atsi's body was preserved encased in ice. All right, so he's obviously in a in a, a cold area, and so what we what we see here is a sign, a shoe. But what is the significance of the shoe? The significance of the shoe seems to uh, tell us something about creativity and about a kind of mastery over nature. Let's go back to this: the arrow lodged in the shoulder, the blood, the traces of blood on the knife blade on the knife blade the apparent blow to the back of the head. Well, that also, once we have this information, well, these are signs. A, an arrow lodged in the body is a sign. An injury in the back of the head is, is a sign. Traces of blood on a knife, that's a sign. What do they signify? Well, they signify that Atsi apparently lived in a violent world in which he himself participated. And so, Notice that already a somewhat complex character is emerging, a character that is creative, that demonstrates some mastery over the natural world. Also a, a being, a creature, a human, that is creative, exercises mastery over the natural world to some degree, but is also violent and is apparently the object of violence. And so uh, something of a mixed creature here. We keep going. A coat made of sheep and goat skin. So notice we've had uh, clothing thus far involving deer skin. Uh, what do we have? Uh, deer hide, bear skin. Here we have sheep and goat skin. We have the knife. We have an axe that uh, 
that Atsi had, the axe made of uh, copper, right? And here we have the monument to Atsi. Now there's a lot more information about Atsi, or as he should be called, Utsi. Uh, there's a lot more information about him that, that you can look up. What I'm doing is just, um, I'm wanting to present to you this idea of signs. Even what little we had there, we have signs. We have a knife, we have an arrowhead, we have a shoe, we have a coat, and we, and we can identify those signs. And we say, but what do these signs signify? They tell us something about this human being who lived um, uh, over 5,000 years ago. A wall is a sign. You look at a wall and you say, what is that? That's a wall. That's a sign. Well, the oldest walls we have, the oldest walls humans have, come from the ancient city of Jericho, prehistoric city founded about 9600 B.C. So we're looking at almost 12,000 years ago, right? So we don't have writing uh, in the first several hundred years of, of or the first several thousand years of uh, the history of Jericho, no writing. And so the people of, of, you know, the, the, of ancient Jericho, they can't tell us their thoughts because they didn't leave any writing. Uh, surely they had a language, multiple languages perhaps spoken in that area. But so far as we know, none of it's written down. And so they can't tell us their thoughts. They can't tell us why they did what they did. So if we're going to try to understand their world, we have to ask questions. And we can answer those questions using science. We can also ans answer some of those questions employing what I was describing earlier, sort of a human-to-human -human dialogue. If I was a person who lived in ancient Jericho, why might I have done such and such? And so uh, ancient Jericho, it's the, it's the, the longest lived-in city in the world, so we can trace Jericho back to almost 12,000 years, but still there are people who live in the area. It's very hard to see here, but I have the arrow pointing to a car. So we're looking at a, a bit here of prehistoric Jericho, but then there's a car driving by not far away, sort of the layers of history. This is the part of the world we're talking about. If you look at the south there, uh, then we have Jericho. And just some images. So walls are signs, but what do they mean? Why do humans build walls? What are, if we look around the world today, humans build walls for different reasons. What are some of those reasons? And then if we study Jericho a bit, if we read about Jericho, if we listen to lectures on Jericho, then we can decide, you know, which of these reasons make the most sense in the context of Jericho. So a wall is a sign, but what does a wall signify? At Jericho is a huge tower, the oldest known tower, 30 feet across, 30 feet in diameter, 28 feet tall, walls five feet thick, right? So a lot of time and effort went into this, it took many years to build. My understanding is that, you know, historians, archaeologists aren't exactly sure what purpose the tower served. And so this is something we can do. We can study the tower, we can read about the tower, we can listen to people talk about the tower, listen to lectures about the tower, and then ask ourselves, if I lived in that part of the world at that moment in history, why might I want to build a big tower like this, which impressively all these years later still stands? So a tower is a sign. What might it signify in this case? We have these kinds of things found near and in ancient Jericho. One of the things we see among people um, from prehistoric times up to the present is a human fascination with recreating images of people. The most obvious example these days would be the selfie, right? Uh, but, you know, sort of the earliest selfies maybe go way back to prehistoric times. What, what do these signs signify? We look at these two images here. These are signs. These are human heads, or at least human-like heads, right? But what do they signify? They might signify some religious interest. There might be other significances. We'd have to think about that. What might these things 
signify. And as we study ancient Jericho, as we study that part of the world, gleaning what we can from all the kinds of academic disciplines, then we can come up with plausible ideas about what these things might have signified. We get these kinds of figurines in ancient Jericho. Again, human forms, uh, perhaps somewhat unusual, but clearly identifiable human-like forms. These are signs. What might they signify? In ancient Jericho, we find uh, plastered human skulls, many of which were kept inside homes. Why would people keep, keep skulls inside homes? And then you notice that shells are sometimes put into the eyes. So this skull comes to us from about 9,000 years ago. It's covered with plaster. The eye sockets are inlaid with seashells. The skull belonged to an adult male. And you have these skulls inside homes. Is this the prehistoric equivalent of having a photograph of your grandfather in the home? Is this a prehistoric equivalent of what we find, for example, in Vietnam, where in homes many people have shrines have shrines uh, set up uh, really for the worship of their ancestors? Is that what this is? I guess we can't know for absolute certain because prehistoric residents of Jericho didn't write anything down, and so we can't really know what was going on in their own minds. But we can do that work of, of, of gathering ideas from around the world. What it, you know, how might this make sense? Maybe this is you know, the, uh, the earliest example of what's very common, of having photographs around the house of family members. But of course, you can't have photographs in the prehistoric world. Maybe the next best thing is a plastered skull of a loved one, or maybe there's ancestor worship involved here. Maybe these are the heads of defeated enemies. We can't know for certain, but we can, we can exercise our minds and we can come up with plausible hypotheses, right? So a skull is a sign, a home is a sign, a skull in a prehistoric home, that's a sign. What does it signify? Well, we can't know for certain probably, but we can come up with plausible ideas. Here are some other skulls that we'll find that we find from prehistoric Jericho. And then something else we see in prehistory is cave art. And you can see all of the dots there. There, there are many, many caves. We're here we're focusing on, on Europe. There are many, many caves in Europe that have impressive art. And some of the best known are in France, Lascaux, Chauvet. Also in Spain, uh, there are important caves as well. And here we're talking about art that's even older than Jericho. And Jericho, of course, is early Jericho is older than, than Atsi. Now we're looking at art that's older than Jericho. And it's interesting, in, in, in this bit of cave art, that's the word we're using. Did prehistoric people have the conception of art when we refer to this as art? Is that what they're thinking of? I guess we can't specifically know the answer to that question, but we use this term art. Notice that the animals there are pretty easily identifiable. Notice that the people look much less natural. The animals look quite realistic. The people actually don't. That's interesting. What might that mean? Each of those images is a sign. What do those signs signify? Here we have uh, remarkable depictions of animals. Very common in these caves to find depictions of animals, of bison, horses, deer. There's a bear up top. Looks like uh, horses, but look like zebras down below. They have the appearance anyway of zebras. And then notice that above the zebras there you have handprints, right? And we see these as well, handprints. People are, are putting images on walls of of animals and other things, but also of hands. Why, what, you know, what might motivate me to do that, right? So the image of the hand is a sign. What does it signify? Now what's interesting is that researchers have identified that in addition to animals, there are some signs that appear with some regularity in, in uh, caves that are far apart. Caves that are far apart not only in ge geographically in distance, but also far apart in time. And if you look at the image on the top, uh, that gives us um, signs that appear with some regularity. At least, at least a number of them appear 
with some regularity. And you can look some of these images up. And the very plausible idea is that those images are kind of um, perhaps some of the very earliest um, efforts at written language that we have. They're called pictographs, right? So they're, they're pictures or you know, drawings of objects. They obviously have some meaning. We can't know what the meaning is. Um, and are, are these sort of the images of the, the very first efforts at what will eventually become written language, right? You see the, the image below. You've got these hands all over the place. If you look in the, in the box above, you have what's called the positive hands, right? This is a symbol that shows up in a number of different caves. Down below, we have these hands all over the place and you see the hands there. Here we see other images. In this case, we're not looking at animals. Here we're looking at other depictions that clearly had some meaning to the people who, 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 who put them on these cave walls. But what do they signify? The signs, we can identify the signs. We can name the signs. We can draw the signs. What do the signs signify? Well, since the prehistoric, we probably can't know for certain. But perhaps we can piece things together and come up with some plausible thoughts about that. And so this very important book by St. Augustine. And the central question of this book is, how can I be a good reader of the Bible? And then the next question is, how can I be a good teacher of the Bible? Right? And the advice that Augustine offers us is actually good more generally. You just ask the question, how can I be a good reader? And how can I be a good teacher? This, this book offers great advice. And one of the things Augustine says is, look, we don't want to be just superficial readers. We want to be good readers. We want to be deep readers. And not only readers of texts, but readers of the world. And all around us are signs. And we identify those signs, but we want to see the significance of the signs. What do the signs mean? And I hope we've seen in this discussion that um, we can do this in history. With prehistory, it's a little harder because we don't have any text to help us. And so we kind of have to do all of the work in collaboration with people from other disciplines. But we can say, well, there's a sign. You know, Atsi, Utsi, to give the correct pronunciation. He had things with him that were signs. What do those signs mean? What do they tell us about prehistoric people? We have those signs in the caves. What are possible what are likely hypotheses? What are good hypotheses about what those signs meant? What are the meanings of those signs? And what does it mean that from the most ancient times, people have been inclined to create depictions of themselves, things that look like themselves, putting their handprints on walls? What does that mean? We know what the signs are, but what do the signs mean?